Good morning, everyone. It is good to be back after a month and a half away. And I'll ask you to open your Bibles on Joshua 11. Joshua chapter 11. We're going to read verses 1 through 15. Joshua 11, verses 1 through 15. So I'm going to read it. When David, king of Hazor, heard of this, he sent to Jobab, king of Madon, and to the king of Shimron, and to the king of Ahzab, and to the kings who were in the northern hill country, and in the Arabah, south of Kinnerot, and in the lowland, and the Nakhordor on the west, to the Canaanites in the east and the west, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Jebusites in the hill country and the Hivites under Hermon in the land of Mizpah. And they came out with all their troops, a great host, in number like the sand that is upon the seashore, with very many horses and chariots. And all these kings joined their forces and came and camped together at the waters of Meron to fight with Israel. Verse 6, And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them, for tomorrow at this time I will give over all of them, slain to Israel. You shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. So Joshua came suddenly upon them with all his people of war by the waters of Merom and fell upon them. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Israel, who smote them and chased them as far as the great Sidon and Mizrephot Ma'in, and eastward as far as the valley of Mizpah. And they smote them until they left none remaining. And Joshua did to them as the Lord bade him. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots with fire. And Joshua turned back at the time, took Hazor, and smote its king with a sword. For Hazor formerly was the head of all those kingdoms. And they put to the sword all who were in it, utterly destroying them. There was none left that breathed. And he burned Hazor with fire. And all the cities of those kings and all their kings Joshua took and smote them with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them, as Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded. But none of the cities they stood in mountains with Israel burned, except Hazor only, that Joshua burned. And all the spoil of the cities and the cattle the people of Israel took for their booty. But every man they smote with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them, and they did not leave any that breathed, as the Lord had commanded Moses his servant. So Moses commanded Joshua, and so Joshua did. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. Word of the Lord. Dear God, please make the preaching true, make our hearts open, and may our living right. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, Joshua's copies of Canaan, if I tell you that, Joshua's conquest of Canaan. What is the first word that comes into your mind? I bet it's probably Jericho, right? There are kids' songs about Jericho. There are Veggie Tales episodes. Um, if you're a Sunday school champion, maybe you're going to remember I and Akan or the Gibeonites. But it's very unlikely that you're going to remember Hazor, this battlefield, this episode we just read about. And this is interesting because this is actually the toughest battle. Hazor is actually the greatest challenge in the conquest of Canaan. And there are great theological lessons here. So my proposition here to you today is this, is that the, greatest, the great challenges in the life of the people of God are a divine boot camp to drill us in one, confidence, two, trust, and three, rest. I'm going to say it again. The great challenges in the life of the people of God are a divine boot camp to drill us in three things, three skills. One is confidence, two is trust, and three is rest. Now let's begin the exposition. Verses 1 through 5, you have the people being trained to confidence in battle. And I'm going to tell you why. You see here, this is the northern Canaanite league. This is going to be like the last big episode of the conquest. Naturally, the conquest goes on for a long time. There are little pockets of resistance, of Canaanite resistance here and there. 
But of all the episodes in Jericho, this is going to be the last one. This is the big one. This is the season finale. This is like the big boss in the end. It's the northern Canaanite region. This chapter 11. If you go back to chapter 10, you're going to see details of how the southern Canaanite league was conquered. And then how Joshua made a tour there in the Nadab, which is the desert, in the Shephelah, which is the hill country between the high hills and the coastal plain, how he conquered the coastal plain. If you go back in another chapter, you're going to see how the Gibeonites, they played the Israelites into an alliance and how, and how he managed that. If you go a chapter, you know, even a chapter back, you're going to see the conquest of Ai, a small town. First, they get a beating because there was sin in the camp of Israel, and then they repent. And then in the second battle, they win. And then if you go even back, even one further, uh, chapter 6, it'll be Jericho. And things get harder as the story progresses. And now here, we have Hazor, the chief city of northern Canaan. This is the town that connects the road coming down from Egypt and then going to Mesopotamia. This is, this is a, a commercial hub. You have plenty of temples for many gods because many nationalities live there. This is not some backwater town, back road town. This is not, this is not some hillbilly countryside of Canaan. This is the hub of northern Canaan. Hazor. Now, how formidable must the onset have been had the Israelites not been gradually trained to conquer in battle? So God trained them up, little by little, with increasing, increasing hardiness, increasing levels of complexity, until they came here to fight Hazor. Now, confidence in battle does not mean self-assurance or self-reliance. We just, it just means that we see a progression here. A mere half a century earlier, when the spies were first sent into Canaan, they said the land is good, but we cannot conquer those people. We're too weak, they're too strong. Now, half a century later, they're taking on the northern Canaanite. Was that out of their own might, out of their own force, strength? No. God trained them up to confidence in battle. Then we go to the second point, verses 6 through 9. God knows it's a big challenge. He knows what He throws at us. The challenges don't escape God. He knows what's coming. So he says, be not afraid. It's verse 6. So, I know God. I know we've taken on Jericho. I know we've taken on I, the Gideonites. We've taken the southern league with the whole people from Hebron and Jerusalem. Where Jebus, as it was called at the time. But this is Hazor. This is a whole other cattle of fish. Like, we cannot take this. He says, be not afraid. And why do you fear that town so much? And I'll tell you why. This is a big town. This is a town in the Iron Age. With horses and chariots. Who are the Israelites? They're, they're a Bronze Age people with clubs and, and bronze swords coming from, from the desert. Just militiamen, no cavalry. They're fighting the waters of Merah, which is, which is a valley. If you fight in a valley, a plain place, without horses, against cavalry, you're done. But God says, be not afraid. And I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Their key weapon is what? The cavalry? Well, then you're going to hamstring their horses. And they're going to burn the chariots. Their key weapons against you are not going to prevail. You're going to go up there because I told you to. And this is how God teaches us in His boot camp to trust His might. Now, the Lord's might just despises the enemies. doesn't matter how strong they are. So those militiamen were made into men of war against such strong cavalry and in, in, in such a host of armies. This is one people in several countries. You see, you've seen how many, how many towns like I've read here, how many kings are coming up against the Israelites, the Israelite tribes. But so is this life. This is a picture of how the Christian's life is. When you imagine persecution of the church, what can we do against such powerful countries that persecute the church all over the place? The Christian's army is prayer and Bible reading, virtuous living. How can that beat, beat a whole, whole governments with the armies? Well, but that's just what's been happening throughout history. Where is the Roman Empire? Here in the church, 
We're right here, like 34 of us. But where's the Roman Empire? No, it's might. We visit its ruins when we travel abroad, when we travel to Italy, whatever, but where is its might? You know why? It's because the people of God is the animal that has worn out many a hammer of secular powers. We are trained to trust in His might. The tribulations that God sends us are trainings for us to trust in His might. And it's interesting that there is no detail here of how this this took place. How did the Israelites defeat all these armies in the waters of Merah? I don't know. Because we have details in Jericho. Like they went around the, the wall of St. Thomas. <laughs> we have details in Ai, so they made an ambush. We have details in Southern Kenline Lee. It, it's the, the, if you read chapters 9 and 10, you know that there was a miracle in the battle of Ajavon. Then they went down, they went up, they're here, there. They're detailed. Tell me there's no details. It only says this in verse 8. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Israel. How did a bunch of fishermen following Jesus of Nazareth ultimately defeat the Roman Empire? I don't know. But here we are, aren't we? The Lord delivered. And he's the blacksmith. That's why, that's why the hammer doesn't get run out. The hammer will... Just found, found the hammer. The hammer will not come back. But there comes a point where the hammer just is worn out, it's gone, and the hammer is there. And so shall it be until Jesus returns. So we've seen that God's, God trains us in confidence and in trust. And now for the third point, verses 10 through 15, is going to see the final point. He trains us to rest in His providence. Because this was just part one of the battle. The coalition of armies at the waters of Meron and the valley. Joshua said, okay, we this, now let's go up to Hazor. Now let's invade the city itself. And Joshua turned back at that time and took Hazor and smote its king with the sword. Now, if, if the waters of Meron, the battle that happened there, were a very unlikely victory, to go up against Hazor itself would be impossible. How can men with clubs and bronze swords defeat such powerful walls? I was there a few weeks ago. How could have they done this? I mean, everybody knew that Hazor was eventually destroyed because there was this big, a big mound there. But nobody really believed it had been the Israelites. If people just look at the Bible and say, well, this is a legendary tale. Like an ideology, in the sense that it explains how something came to be, but this is a legendary tale written centuries after the events. But was it? Was it really? Because in the 20th century, when archaeology, beautiful archaeology, started taking place, when I say beautiful archaeology, I don't mean archaeology done by Christians, I mean archaeology done in the land of the Bible. So they started excavating Hazor. And they found some interesting things. First off, whoever conquered Hazor did not take back the idols. There are many temples there. They did not take back the idols, which would be the case. You know, like when the Babylonians, they destroyed the Temple of Jerusalem. You don't have an, an image of the Israelite God. So they take the utensils. But when you conquer people, you take their gods. You know, like you're, you're absorbing their power. Now into your fold. So whoever conquered Azor, not only did not take the gods, but they decapitated teraphines with bronze utensils. And you can actually see them in this museum. I saw them, you know, the little gods with the heads cut off. So whoever destroyed Azor hated other gods. It's pretty much monotheist. So also, whoever destroyed Azor made sure to go to to the Egyptian quarter, kind of Egyptian palace, temple, and defaced the cartouche, where we had the royal names of the pharaohs there. So, not only the people who took Hazor hated other gods, they also had a bad history with the Egyptians. Sound familiar? And then finally, it was burned down entirely. Like, there is a burned down layer of destruction that the archaeologists discovered. And this is so weird. Why would burn down a city? 
Joshua didn't do that, except for one city, and it says here, except Hazor only, verse 13. That's why Jewish archaeologist Igari Adin, he said, there is no doubt that the destruction of Hazor should be ascribed to the Israelite tribes. And why should this surprise us? Because God commanded it. And if he wills something, it will happen. It doesn't matter how hard it looks. So from verse 15, this is the only detail of the battle itself that the Bible gives here. It says, Let nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. How what was the strategy? Was there an ambush? Did they use siege weapons? How did he go up against us? We don't know. The Lord delivered them as he said he would. As he had commanded them to do, they did. So, if God wills it, it will happen, no matter how impossible they seem to us. And there's a big theological lesson here. That providence is larger than discouragement. Many times you are discouraged. Many times you are, but th those are the times we forget about God's providence. So when we look at a tough time like this, like Josh was looking here, or we look in our lives, what do we do with that? Well, don't let good tribulation go to waste, because God is training us for something. This is how He trains us. This is how He builds us up. So he trains us in confidence. To confidence in battle, to trust in his mind, and to rest in his promise. This is interesting. Because we don't think of rest as something you need to learn to do. But the truth is we do. Because if we don't learn to rest in God's promise, we take everything to our own hands. And if Joshua had been up against Hazor with his own strategy, he would not, he would not have succeeded. The only, the only reason the conquest happened is because the Lord delivered. So he, because he told them to do something, and he did, and Joshua did, he followed through. Now this, you might tell me, this is easier said than done. You know, you don't know what I'm going through, you know how impossible it is. I know God has delivered me from times before, but now I'm just going through something so hard, you just don't know how hard it is, and I don't think I'm going to make it. Well, this, if you tell me that it's easier said than done, then I... I reply to you, I answer you that. Good thing that he is the one that is actually at work, right? Because he commanded to go up against his order to conquer the land, and he delivered them. So it, it's, it, this is not more impossible to fulfill than it is for us to, uh, than it was for well, when Jesus commanded the man with the withered hand to stretch it forward. And that's precisely what he could not do. When Jesus commanded Lazarus to come back, to, to come out of the tomb, that's precisely what we could not do. But when Jesus tells us to repent and believe, that's precisely what we ourselves cannot do. We cannot do that out of our own accord, out of our own will, out of our own mind. And yet here we are, aren't we? What is harder for fallen men and women like ourselves to once have repented and believed or to face whatever it is we have to face now? The hardest part is gone. And it's gone because He Himself works, worked for us and in us. And He will do so until the end of time. That's why I hope that when you come back to Joshua 11, you don't see a simple description of historical events. You see here a typology, a type of rest and progress. God trains us in confidence in battle. He teaches us to trust in His mind and to rest in His providence. That's how we got saved individually. That's how we're going to take the gospel to the nations and disciple them. Not in our own mind, but in the mind of our God. God's good care teaches us to look to Him, not to our mind. May this be true in everything we do, and may He help us in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.